when I was given this title, I was thinking this was going to be really easy to talk about genomics as a, a complete success story. And uh, when I got thinking about it some more, I was thinking that uh, we shouldn't judge it on what we did in the past, but what we could have done or what the potential is for us. So I'm going to be a little critical uh, about where we've come and what we've done, but not, it's not going to be critical at breeders. It's really at what could we have done as an industry over this last 10 years and what did we do? So there are some very positive parts, but there's also some, some critical parts as well. Uh, so the, it, the, the, the solid grade A uh, report card is what I was expecting I was going to give, but actually there's going to be uh, a few parts when you start looking at the different categories that, uh, that we're going to evaluate here this morning. Uh, the first subject, genomic evaluation, very important that we provide relatively accurate genomic rankings. And I say relatively because it's relative to uh, an unproven uh, bull that uh, uh, when we're talking about juvenile sires and parent averages, the, the accuracy was relatively low. With genomics, we're going to add quite a bit of accuracy, but not uh, quite to the level of, of progeny tested sires. Genetic improvement, of course, is we're going to look at, well, what kind of improvement, how much improvement did we actually make? Uh, these are both very important topics, so they get uh, six credits each. On-farm testing will be the next category we'll look at, uh, and we'll look at, did we develop genomic tests that were used for on-farm use? Next, uh, a topic that actually uh, there's a lot of controversy about genetic diversity. Are we, how are we doing in this regard? Uh, the reason it's only three credits is because it's in the future, and we value things in the present more than we value things uh, in the future. But we need to look at, are we preserving genetic variation for future use? Uh, the next topic is understanding genotype to phenotype. Again, we want to identify genotypes that predict or change the phenotype. Uh, this has proven to be a little harder than we thought, so we'll talk a little about that. And then last but not least, certainly, is are we meeting consumer expectations? Are we producing products that consumers value? And uh, from this, I'm borrowing my, uh, from my experience at Monsanto that the consumer is important. We cannot leave out the conversation with the consumer. Uh, if we don't uh, take that into account, then we're going to lose ground versus other uh, products that the consumer has to choose from. So let's get started on genomic evaluation. Just a quick review. In the top left corner, what you see is a group of animals. This is what we're referring to as a reference population. And a reference population is a group of animals, a subset of the population where we have all the phenotypes that we're interested in for all the traits, and then we have genotypes for thousands of SNPs. We can make the associations then between the genotypes and the phenotypes and come up with these prediction equations. So for future animals, the rest of the population and future population, all we need is a genotype, the thousands of SNPs. We apply that prediction equation and we're able to come up with a genomic estimated breeding value. So it's, uh, it's revolutionary. We no, no longer do we need to have phenotypes across the whole, genera the whole population. We really just need it in a subset of the population. And this is a tremendous advantage because we can invest our phenotyping dollars in a subset of the population and maybe measure more traits than we measured in the past. And we can measure them more accurately and we can measure more uh, expensive traits than we would consider measuring in the past. So the result, uh, when you look at the usage, and this is how breeders have voted with their pocketbooks. The blue bar at the bottom represents young genotyped bulls. And it's no, it's, it's no news to you that uh, the majority of semen is from young genotyped sires, or uh, genomic bulls is what we call them. Uh, the proven bull, the, the pink uh, bars, uh, has decreased over time, but I think you'll agree that they're still, they play a role. And uh, when we get to the end, we can talk more about uh, the relative value of, of both of these. Um, and then older sires uh, have continually uh, decreased in use because the speed of, 
uh, the, the genetic improvement that we're making uh, is those, those older bulls are just having trouble keeping up. There's hardly any, there's a, a few slivers there of non-genotype sires, but essentially the AI industry has gone completely to genotype sires, and we wouldn't really consider putting a bull into service that is not genotype. Uh, and the reason that uh, we have voted with our pocketbooks is because you can see the, the change in reliability uh, as a result of genomics, uh, particularly the, the top three uh, areas, young bulls from uh, proven sires, uh, young bulls and heifers from young sires, and then heifers themselves. The top two are based on a 50K genotype, or genotype uh, a 50K SNP chip. Uh, heifers, this would be based on a, uh, a, a low-density chip. And you can see the tremendous uh, increase in reliability in that age group. So it's, it's not perfect, but given the fact that they're so young and they're so genetically advanced, it's a, it's a very good trade-off. Whereas you can see the first crop proven sires, uh, there's less to be gained from adding genomic information because the, the progeny test is already quite informative. Uh, it has helped foreign sires uh, and foreign cows more uh, because you're, you're bringing information uh, that's uh, the, the genotype or the genetics doesn't change regardless of uh, which uh, country boundary you're at. But uh, I will point out that there still is a, a gap between proven sires and young bulls. Even with genomic testing, there is a considerable difference in reliability. And, and if you're interested in stability of your evaluation, uh, then proven bulls are still a, uh, a good uh, opportunity, and they tend to be priced relatively well. But if you want to be right at the forefront, uh, then the genomic sires are really the ones that are delivering that top-end performance. Now, if you look at how they compare uh, and this is where I start to get a little critical here, that uh, when you look at the top 400 TPI bulls from 2016, and then you look at those same bulls three years later, this is even before they get a genomic, or uh, sorry, before they get a progeny test, you'll see that there's some slippage. Uh, on average, they've, they've dropped about 150 points, some more, some less. Now, you know, when, when you're studying uh, genetics, genomics in school, one of the questions that'll come up uh, is, if you take a top sire that has BLUP evaluations, would you expect the bull to go up more or go down more? And if you do have BLUP evaluations, best linear unbiased prediction, they should go up as often as they go down. So uh, clearly, we do not have BLUP at the top end of the population. It's, it's more best linear predictions, uh, but they're not unbiased. And so we've got some bias going on that I think we can do a better job of, of correcting for that slippage. Now, uh, you know, bias, as long as they rank the same, no harm done. You just know that there's a bias there. You know that they're going to, to slip a bit over time. And the reason that happens, really, is because you're adding more information on certain combinations of SNPs, where they might not be very well represented at the beginning, uh, but as you add information on those, some of those, those very high-flying SNPs uh, start to get reevaluated downwards when you get more information. On top of that, um, we do a very good job of pre-selecting our bulls. And in the AI industry, uh, you do a good job of eliminating uh, young bulls that don't have the potential to make it to the very e top echelons. So that pre-selection bias uh, is part of what's, what's uh, coming into play here is our, our genomic evaluation systems are expecting it to be unpreselected, And when we add that pre-selection bias, we do start to get some of that slippage. Now, we can move towards uh, a newer type of evaluation called single step. We're currently doing a two-step. The single step evaluation will hopefully improve and, and remove some of this bias. But you guys are breeders, and you market not based on the the number is important, but it's the rank, the relative rank in the population. So when you look at those same 400 bulls and you compare their ranks from when they were in April 2016 uh, versus uh, April 2019, you see a, a scattered plot here. And the correlation is about 
0.36. This was actually lower than I expected. It, what it means is that in that top group, you've got some re-ranking going on. So the ones in the bottom left-hand corner, they were highly ranked, the highest uh, in that 2016 group, and they're still highly ranked. But there's some at the top left corner that dropped. So they are no longer in the top of that top 400. Whereas the ones on the, the right-hand side, the bottom right, those are ones that have a high ranking, uh, or sorry, they, they were not ranked that highly in 2016, but now they are highly ranked in that group. So what is this telling you? Um, one thing it's telling us is that the accuracy at the very top part of the population is not as good as in the whole population. And the reason is, is, is really comes down to heritability at the top of the population is not quite the same as what it is uh, in the, the, the main part of the population. Because we've, by pre-selecting those top animals, we've reduced the amount of genetic variation right at the top. So the re-ranking uh, is a bit of an issue if you're marketing bulls, if you're marketing cows, embryos, this re-ranking can play havoc with your marketing program. Uh, and I, I, I think that is a, a bit of a, a concern. Um, can we do something about uh, creating uh, a system that looks at the top part of the population and, and does a better job uh, in ranking them accurately over time? So, it wasn't an A+, plus. it's an A, uh, because I think we applied the theory relatively quickly. Uh, there was very good uptake from the industry, so I think we've all done a good job of taking up this, this new technology. Uh, but hap, perhaps there's still a little too much instability at the top of our population. All right, what about genetic improvement? So this is the formula for genetic improvement. You've probably seen that before. Uh, selection intensity is I, R is accuracy, genetic variation, and it's all divided by L, which is the generation interval. Uh, we've given up a little accuracy, but we've increased selection intensity, so they kind of balance out. The big change, and I think this was pointed out already by Corey, is the generation interval. In all of the, the pathways we've gone down, in particular, bull sires and bull dams have decreased the most. So bull sires, we were used to selecting progeny tested bulls, using those as mating sires. Now we're using young sires. And now you can see uh, that has had a tremendous uh, in, impact on the, the turnover uh, of these uh, top animals. Of course, that makes it harder to market, right? Because the, the top animals are continually turning over. Uh, it's harder to get uh, excited about an elite bull or elite donor that only is going to be in the limelight for a short period of time. Uh, now, uh, this slide Corey also showed as well. Uh, it, it does show a significant improvement in the rate of genetic gain. So I think um, between these two groups, you see about a, a $33 difference. But if you look over the 10-year period, it's about a $50 difference. And I think uh, Hordes Dairyman just had an article that came out that showed $50 per cow per year because of genomics. Uh, 4.5 million, 4.5 billion dollars in value when you look at over 9 million cows over 10 years, is a tremendous uh, ad advantage in terms of net merit uh, in our dairy herd. So this additional investment to create genomics was about 100 million. Uh, so that's a, a return on investment of about 45 to 1. That, that's, that's nothing short of amazing. And I don't think there's any other, any other species in the animal uh, improvement world, even in the crop world, that you see that kind of uh, payback, that kind of return on investment. So I think, uh, I think as an industry, we can give ourselves a, 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 a strong pat on the back for that kind of investment and that kind of return. So um, one other part is looking at particular traits that were difficult traits. They were low heritability traits, uh, fertility, health, longevity very important economically, but we couldn't put very much pressure on them because that heritability was so low. The advantage of genomics is if, if you have a large enough reference population and you invest in that and you collect those phenotypes, you can actually make pretty good progress. And so what we're seeing here is tripling uh, 
uh, rate of response on some of these, these low heritability traits like longevity, health, fertility. Uh, I think is why we're seeing some of the trends, uh, positive trends uh, in, in our population today. So from a genetic improvement, I, I don't think we can give any less than an A+. Uh, we've doubled or tripled our genetic progress. We've made significant progress on some of these low heritability traits, and it's been a phenomenal return on our, on our investment. All right, so let's, let's move to on-farm testing. Uh, this slide, uh, or a version of that, uh, Corey showed earlier that you can see that uh, although bulls, uh, relatively low in number, but it's essentially it's 100% of the bull population is being genomically tested. Cows, we're at about 650,000 a year, um, and the, the, the slope upwards is really impressive. Uh, but when you look at 4.2 million heifers born per year, this 700 or 650,000 is about 15% of the heifers are tested. So, you know, is that good? Uh, it could be a lot better. We should probably be testing 85% of our animals. And, and one of the main imp reasons for doing that is for animal ID. Uh, when you, particularly large herds, when they start uh, using genomic testing, and this is why you see the uptake of genomic testing better in large herds, is they realize that their animal ID was what's much less than they thought it was. And when you start doing genomic testing, you realize exactly where you're at in terms of ID. Uh, but you also realize that there's a lot more you can do than animal ID or just culling. A lot of farms are still using genomic testing just for culling decisions. But really, it tells you a lot more about what you can do with your herd. And you, you can divide your herd. Uh, the very elite part could be used for IVF. Um, maybe just below that, you'd want to use your sex semen or below that, conventional, and then maybe below that, you, you breed to beef or you cull. Uh, probably the, the beef uh, segment here has probably grown uh, since this slide was first made. Uh, with the advent of sex semen, uh, there's so much more opportunity to, uh, to use beef in the bottom end of the dairy herd. And when you do this properly, you can uh, make a lot of uh, extra dollars and make better decisions with the animals that you're you're going to uh, use going forward. Um, and uh, one of the things we've tried to do at CMEX is to make this easy. Uh, we use this uh, a handheld uh, package called Elevate, and, uh, and that helps to make uh, this process uh, simple, simple to genotype, and simple to, uh, to make these decisions when you get the results back, all delivered for you with your handheld. So on-farm testing, uh, I think more of a C. Uh, we've improved animal, animal ID for sure. Uh, we have many farms uh, that are now testing, but they might not test the whole herd. They might only test a little bit that they think might be good for marketing, but they probably could use it across the herd or a lar much larger proportion of the herd. And we can use it certainly for more than just culling. Uh, I think uh, the main reason not a B but a C is, is really that we still are underusing this very valuable technology that we could be using on farm. Now, genetic diversity, uh, I talked to some of my colleagues, um, and this is one where we had the most differences of opinion. Uh, when, I, when I first anticipated uh, what the impact of genetic diverse, or what the impact of genomics was going to be on genetic diversity, I thought it was going to improve diversity because it didn't matter what the sire of the dam was, it just mattered what the collection of genes were that that animal contained. And so, in theory, we should have been selecting animals from a lot of different families. But that's not what happened. What you can see is the rate of genomic, uh, or I should say inbreeding in general, has almost doubled uh, in the period of genomics. So why, why has that occurred? Why have we continued to focus on so few blue bloodlines? And part of the answer, and I'm not sure I know all the answers why, but part may be that our expectations have gone up. We have so many bulls to choose from now, and we have more traits that we can examine. So now, as farmers, we want to have a bull that has it all. They have to be high in the index that we're looking at, whether it's TPI or net merit, but we also don't want to see any holes. We don't want to see 
an animal that's not good for conception rate. Uh, we don't want to use a, a bull that has teats that are too short or legs that are too straight. And, and these are all valid concerns. But what we end up doing is being very picky. And we end up selecting fewer and fewer bloodlines that tend to have all of those, uh, those, those traits that we want. So we end up putting more and more pressure, fewer and fewer bloodlines. Uh, and that is, is going to be a, a problem uh, in the long run. So inbreeding uh, is one of the, the things that happens when you lose diversity. And we all know about inbreeding depression uh, for each loss of, or each uh, um, uh, percent of inbreeding, we have a certain amount of loss in yield traits and particularly uh, fertility and, and health traits. And these are, uh, have been documented over the years. Uh, but is inbreeding always bad? What you see here is uh, this is the genome of a bull that's fairly highly inbred, about 19% genomic inbreeding. And the red sections are the homozygous sections of the genome. So chromosome 2 at the top there has a long stretch of homozygous genotypes. Uh, it's called a run of homozygosity. And that's an indication that inbreeding exists uh, very strongly uh, on chromosome 2. And it's been fairly recent inbreeding, which is probably the worst kind of inbreeding. But uh, what really matters is where is that inbreeding in the genome. Before, we had pedigree inbreeding that just looked at the pedigree. Uh, and we didn't know, was it good inbreeding or bad inbreeding? And what I mean by good inbreeding or bad inbreeding is it depends on what portion of the genome is inbred. So for example, uh, if you have a favorable allele on chromosome 11, and that happens to be an inbred section, is that bad? It's probably good, because you want to have more of the positive alleles. Now, there's a, a recessive deleterious allele here on chromosome 4. If that was an inbred section, that would be bad, because there's more chance that that inbred allele is going to show up and cause a problem in your herd. So it really does depend. And now with genomic tools, we can start to look at where does this inbreeding occur in the genome. And if we want to tally the pros and the cons, we can see on the bad side, uh, there's inbreeding depression has increased. This reduces fertility and production. We have uh, a higher probability of genetic defe defects and diseases uh, surfacing in our herds. And then from a long-term perspective, uh, we have a loss of variation between families. And this is, this is a problem in terms of long-term genetic gain. Now, on the good side, the pros, we have more uniformity in the best regions, which is a good thing. The desirable alleles tend to be fixed in our population, which is a good thing. And if there are undesirable alleles, they tend to show up. And then they end up getting purged from the population, which is also a good thing. If there's going to be crossbreeding, uh, you can have more potential hybrid vigor when you make those crosses when you have more inbred uh, parent breed lines. But the, the big thing that I worry about is this effective population size that we have as a result of inbreeding and this narrow selection on fewer bloodlines. The effective population size for the Holstein breed is now less than 50. And that means the effective number of progenitors that uh, are, are behind our current population. And what that means is about a 20% uh, sacrifice in long-term genetic gain. So from that perspective, I'll give a C minus. We have too much focus on the top few bloodlines. Inbreeding is increasing. Uh, but is it really a problem? It really depends on where that inbreeding is occurring. And we're probably sacrificing too much long-term progress. Uh, the next category was understanding genotype to phenotype. And this is a case where when we started down this path, we thought, OK, this genomic uh, uh, tool is going to help us understand where is all the variation coming from and what's causing that trait and this trait and that trait. Uh, as it turns out, uh, maybe it was a little more complicated than we thought. We essentially still have a black box. We don't necessarily know which genes are causing it. We just have a very good tool for assessing the whole genome at once and coming up with a, a breeding value. So we really haven't improved the black box that much. Uh, and the SNP profile is really only a start. 
Uh, it doesn't tell us a lot about this complicated pathway going from DNA to RNA to protein pathway. Uh, this variation is not really well understood yet. Uh, so things like epigenetics, uh, G by E interactions, these things are not yet well understood and predicted well enough. And as well, non-additive variation. So this is uh, the non-additive variation if you have uh, heterosis or the, the flip side is, is inbreeding depression. Uh, that is not as well understood, although I think there's a lot of groups working on identifying which regions of the genome are responsible for heterosis and for inbreeding depression. Uh, G by T or, or genotype by genotype interactions are going to be, it's going to require more data for us to understand that. And so far we've, we've really discovered uh, just a few additional causative mutations. Um, and this is a list of some of the haplotypes, H1, HH1 through HH6 in the Holstein breed. The ones with asterisks are ones where we have identified the source, the causative mutation. But this is a pretty small list for 10 years of work, right? So I think we still uh, have a lot more t uh, work to do here. Uh, so let's give that a D, mostly because we overpromised and underdelivered. Uh, the genotype to phenotype path is more complex than we thought, and we've identified some genes, but not nearly uh, what the expectation was uh, uh, at the beginning. And finally, uh, meeting consumer expectations. Uh, you know, the consumer expects safe and affordable food, they expect it to be good for the environment. I think in both those categories we've succeeded, although good for the environment, uh, we haven't communicated that very well yet. Uh, consumers want to have hormone or antibiotic free. Uh, have we used genomics to address that? Uh, not sure, not probably. Um, cruelty to animal is a, a, a no-go for consumers and um, we still do a lot of dehorning. I think there's something we can do about that uh, with genomics. And consumers expect uh, more choice, taste, variety, and we're competing with other other drinks, other foods, uh, have we done enough to create enough variability? So um, one of the things I want to address is, is, you know, the environment. We have done a fantastic job increasing milk yield. We've done a, a great job uh, with uh, feed efficiency. Um, it's obviously feed intake has not gone up as much as yield, so this has improved efficiency. The big uh, concern of consumers is methane. Uh, and are we uh, emitting more greenhouse gases from the dairy industry? And what you can see is although we increase the amount of methane per cow, we've, we've greatly decreased the amount of methane per kilogram of milk. So tremendous improvement. Um, and I just want to point out, um, and you probably have trouble reading this, on the left-hand side is dairy. It's actually less than eggs and less than poultry. So we are doing a better job in terms of greenhouse gases per kilogram of product produced. And I don't think we talk about this nearly enough. Methane gets all of the attention, and yet that's only part of the greenhouse gas footprint. So I think we need to do a much better job talking about the improvements we've made in terms of reducing greenhouse gases per kilogram of dairy product produced. And when you look over uh, a period of 1990 to 2012, this study showed we reduced greenhouse gases by 31%. That's fantastic. We should be talking about this. There's other things we can do, uh, some nutritional approaches that we can use to increase or decrease uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well, and we should be looking at that. So from a meet, meeting consumer demands, I think a D minus uh, is, is what I'll assess, mostly because you know, we've, we've improved, improved health and reproduction, but little effort on direct value for consumers. A2A2 is one exception to that. And we've made more milk, or made milk more sustainable, but we, we kind of did it unintentionally. We didn't actually go, actively go out there to, to seek this. So the report card is not all straight A's. Uh, I think we should feel very good that we have, uh, in the main parts, genomic evaluation and genetic improvement. It's been a flying success. Uh, some of these other things are opportunities that we have that we could do better or we can do better going forward. And I, I think paying more attention to consumers is certainly something that we probably need to do a, a much better job uh, when you think about the competition we, uh, we face in the grocery stores. Thank you very much.